and we are now broadcasting to all attendees. So the system will now start slowly popping the people in as everyone comes into the room. Thank you all for being here. I am so delighted. I've been um, really kind of ungovernable with excitement mm -hmm. <laughs> once I realized that I was gonna be able to speak to these two fantastic women. Um, I did the professional thing and did not come in Star Trek cosplay, but I am wearing my Enterprise <laughs> t-shirt today. You may or may not be able to see oh, it. I didn't see that. I'm hoping that I, you know, oh, yeah. this will allow me to continue <laughs> having my job um, after this. I also forgot my uh, Starfleet necklace on. This is just to help me, uh, right. you know, shout out in my own small way, my, my fandom. So thank you all so much for being here. Um, as I said, I want to welcome everyone to uh, this WIF series, Conversations and Connections. I am incredibly excited to bring to you two really amazing women um, to this Zoom room today. Um, Award-winning director, Hannah Lee Culpepper, and a personal acting favorite of mine, the multi-talented Michelle Hurd. Welcome mm -hmm. to Thank both you. of you. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know, I'm Ebony Adams. I'm the manager of public programs at Women in Film. Um, obviously coming to you live from Women in Film satellite offices in my home office in San Fernando Valley, the way people are living these days. Um, I do want to start off by offering a huge thank you to Allison Emilio, who I know is watching. She's the director of reframe um, and she helped coordinate today's conversation uh, for those of you who don't know reframe is an initiative um, from women in film and the sundance institute uh, whose goals are to provide research and support and a practical framework for a cart for companies um, to mitigate bias during the creative decision making and hiring process and if you are at all interested and i hope you will be um, i encourage you to check out wif.org reframe for more information um, about the work that Reframe does and you know who uh, are the incredible creatives that we work with, including people like Hanalei. Um, I wanna let everyone know that today's discussion will be very informal, very casual. Um, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So if you just toggle around the bottom, you'll see the Q&A button. So please submit questions for Hanalei and Michelle there. Um, and then at the end of you know, me fangirling out, uh, I will pose those questions to them. Um, so yeah, let's just go ahead and get started. Oh, I will say that the first season of Star Trek Picard, all episodes are now available. So if you have not caught up, please be aware. Right now. Excuse me? And they're free right now. And they're free, exactly. So you have no excuse not to check out this <laughs> amazing show. Mm -hmm. I will try and keep spoilers to a minimum. We'll talk about larger issues, but just in case, I'm gonna give you the heads up. Spoilers <laughs> may occur, um, so, so please note that. So just to start with, Hanalee Culpepper. Mm -hmm. Chosen to direct the pilot for Star Trek Picard, Hanalee M. Culpepper is the first woman to launch a Star Trek series in its 53-year history. Hey now. Hey. An energetic and unflappable award-winning director, Hanalee's television credits range from superhero action adventures to genre films to character-driven dramas. In 2019, she was selected for the inaugural class of Reframe Rise directors and earned Variety's 2019 Inclusion Impact Honor. She's currently executive producing and directing the pilot of the CW reboot of Kung Fu, spearheaded by Berlanti Productions. Uh, her television career took off after participating at NBC Universal's directing initiative, which led to an episodic directing role uh, for Parenthood. Since then, her television work includes such shows as Counterpart, Mayans MC, Criminal Minds, Grimm, American Crime, The Flash, Gotham, Star Trek Discovery, and Nosferatu. In 2015, Hanalee was nominated for an Image Award for Outstanding Drama for a direct, Directing for a Drama Series. Everybody, please welcome Hanalee. Yay. Michelle Hurd. In her 25 plus year career, actor yeah. Michelle Hurd has played dozens of memorable television roles, including the CBS pilot reboot of Cagney and Lacey, portraying Lacey as co lead opposite Sarah Drew. In addition to her explosive performance as Shepard on NBC's hit drama Blind Spot, she was recently seen on Fox's action crime series Lethal Weapon. Also, Heard is known for stars' hit horror comedy Ash vs. Evil Dead, her role as <laughs> T.A. Samantha Reyes in the Marvel Universe series Daredevil and Jessica Jones, uh, and the Annie Summer series The Glades. Other television credits include Hawaii 5 Younger, Devious Maids, 90210, Witches of Easton, How to Get Away with Murder, Bosch, Mysteries of Lore, basically anything you're watching on TV, Michelle has been in it, has been rocking it. 
Uh, thank you both so much for being here. <laughs> I want to start, uh, Holly, with you. Um, so you have spoken at length uh, in other places about both the burden and excitement of launching this new Star Trek show, um, a show that brings you know, the historic franchise back to our screens, um, but also reacquaints audiences with the beloved character of Jean-Luc Picard. Can you talk a little bit about like what were the initial conversations like between you and showrunner Michael Shaman? Um, you know, how did you work through the, that kind of that burden of expectation while also envisioning how to bring something new uh, to the series? You know, Michael Shaban is a wonderful guy to work with. He's just lovely. He's and he gives great hugs and he wears cool shirts and he's just, you know, it was always a pleasure to go to work with him. And so really our initial conversations with him and Alex Kurtzman and Akiva as well was just, um, you know, going through the whole process and just trying and making these decisions. You kind of, when you have such a big thing that you're about to, you're embarking on, you kind of just have to break it down into the little pieces to figure it all out. And then otherwise, it was really, you know, I, I would have conversations with him about, tell me more, for instance, about Rafi's character. Give us more of the background. He even did like a two-page bio to help us to learn more about what he was imagining for, for her. Um, we also asked them to, give, to tell us, like, what are the key episodes that you want to make sure that everybody watches? There was this really great document that was created that had, like, some of the key facts as well as uh, several episodes that we should watch um yeah so that that's it was just all kind of us really getting into his head as far as how he was imagining this world and you know and conversations coming out of that yeah i'm interested in the um the background episodes that he had you watch and this question is for you too michelle were you was he advising you to watch the same sorts of things or as a director was he saying i'd like for you to watch these but for the actors i'd like to like what sorts of background things was he providing or recommending? I think for that one document, it went to everybody. I think because um, it was really a more of a way to immerse someone in this world, especially for people who maybe did not, you know, obsess yeah. over Star Trek in the next <laughs> generation. Um, or if you're like me and you love, love, love the show, but it had been a while since you've seen it, you can't just go back and watch everything. So it's kind of like a great way for you to get introduced to the key episodes that had themes or characters um, that they that we were going to deal with in the Picard series, and I believe it was all this the same document. I didn't, did he send you anything separate, Michelle? Separate shows to look at? You know, it's kind of strange for me because when I've been in our little um, PR um, tour with the other castmates, and we sort of uh, pair up in different things, everybody else had gotten um, episodes and um, homework. I, I didn't get any homework. Nobody gave me any homework, which I, which is weird because I was like, where is? Shouldn't I be looking at some a bunch of stuff? I will say that uh, I have been a Star Trek person, a Trekkie. You know, my entire family has been a Trekkie. Um, and really, the, what was so beautiful when I got this job, I sort of had a flashback of my childhood. Um, my father is an act, was an actor, he's passed now, a black man. And he had, you know, back in the day in the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, the parts for him were very limited. He played a lot of what he would call Uncle Tom's or, uh, you know, parts that he wasn't, he didn't necessarily want his children to come see. Um, but and he really wanted to make sure that when we watched shows, when we went to the movies or watched TV or went to the um, theater, we watched shows that were inclusive. And when I got this job, I had that flashback of this, this Star Trek mm -hmm. was one of the shows for sure that my father would absolutely encourage us as a family to sit down and watch because it was so inclusive, because it had the very first interracial kiss on television, um, because it, 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 it encompassed what he was trying to um, to teach us, which was that we're, we're all here, we're all valuable, um, and that we, are, we should all be included. I did for myself, um, before I started the show, I actually watched all the Star Trek movies back to back before we got into this, because I wanted to, I wanted to get a sense of where, you know, where we left, mm -hmm. where everybody was when we left, then the time that we all have you know, sp spent off camera, you know, Patrick and Picard, 18 years and how we get back to that that moment so i thought that was the most um helpful way for me to sort of figure out where picard would have left 
the time going by and then jumping in there. So yeah, it was oh, okay. I think part of the homework. So see you, you just ahead. Yeah, uh, clearly they were like, okay, she just gets what we're going for here. So um, she's in the AP division, the varsity search so regularly. We're just going to let her cook. She um, always, she already given us this already, so she knows. Yeah, she knows, she knows what it is. Um, it's interesting that you bring up watching Star Trek as a child with your family, Michelle, because mm -hmm. this is something that I hear from a lot of Star Trek fans, but particularly from Black Star Trek fans. Yep. This idea, this, you know, this shared experience of communal watching um, that really speaks to the way the show presents, you know, not, not a utopia, but certainly, you know, an atmosphere and environment in which, you know, um, racism is being dealt with in a much more mature and critically engaged with, uh, way, in which class, you know, the, the problems of class divisions that we know about today, you know, if not have been dealt with, then certainly have been, you know, are being dealt with in a, in a much more engaged way. And there's something very appealing about that to audiences of color that yeah. we do want to share um, with our families. Um, so I, I love that I have both of you here because you're representing this iconic franchise, this iconic show, and you're two women of color representing a genre that often doesn't make space for us, but this show does. It is yeah. multiracial, it is multi-generational, it is female forward. How does working on this show, you know, differ from other shows that you've worked on? Which is not to, you know, dismiss anything else that you that has, has had like a primarily white cast or primarily male cast, but what's been different for you about this show? Um, everything. Um, you know, I think for myself, one of the things that, um, that I, I was struck by immediately when I, when I just got the audition, like the breakdown for the audition. And, you know, as, as Hanale just said, Michael Chabon, you know, if he could write every single character in line, I could write a uh, speak for the rest of my life, I'd be a happy girl. But reading the breakdown of the character, and I think it goes to what you were just talking about, how people of color um, end up really champion Star Trek, um, is because the character was such a, you know, such a well vetted, such a complex um, woman, woman, mm -hmm. person. I happen to be a person of color that can tell my experience, mm -hmm. contribute my experience to this, you know, very well created character. Yeah, none mm -hmm. of the roles actually even called for color. That's exactly right. It was, we made a conscious effort to, to be diverse. Mm -hmm. uh, but we really were going for the best actors. And so, yeah, they just wrote characters that were full of life, yeah. that, had, that were complex and interesting, and it was not about them being color. of color. Yeah. And that's, that, as an actress, that's, um, you know, first of all, such a gift. Um, and the part that's frustrating when I'm doing other jobs, because, you know, you do a job and it's written like, you know, you know, um, um, you know, Jose walks into, you know, Latino man, 20 something walks into, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, Michelle, black woman, da, 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 John, white guy. And, you know, and they, they write in such a very boxed, you know, sort of um, stereotypical kind of way. And then, you know, the onus as any, in any script, the onus is on the actor to sort of, you know, try to bring, you know, their perspective and their life to it. Uh, but sometimes those characters are written so, with so much, you know, such a tight parameter that your acting ability is sort of, you know, marginalized into this little section. When you write something about a, a character, a human being, you know, and, and finding out their, their backstory and why they're doing the things that they're doing, then when you open the door to having all different shades uh, come in and, and read for that, the people who are, um, you know, the people like the directors and the producers who are, you know, receiving that information, they get so much more information about that character because they've opened the door to multiple types of interpretations and perspectives because there's different shades, you know, because we all live a different life. Um, so I think that's one of the biggest things that's been so impactful for all of us, the actors, is, is really straight up the writing um, and having, you know, directors like Hanale, um, incredibly diverse and creative people to, to help us tell the story from their perspective as well as our perspective. That's fantastic. Um, Hanali, can you talk about how you went about setting the tone of the first three episodes of Picard um, and, you know, set the tone in ways that would remain, you know, a kind of compelling through line 
throughout the series. I'm thinking specifically of the look of the show. Um, as a science fiction fan, I'm you know, well versed in science fiction media that seems to use the same palette for absolutely everything. It's, you know, it's a very cold palette. It tends to use, you know, lots of blues and grays. It's very slick surfaces. Um, it privileges kind of the industrial over the organic, but that's not what we get. And so you have created this very rich, very tactile, um, you know, universe here. Can you talk a little bit about how you, how you set that up? Mm -hmm. Sure, I uh, intentionally did not want to go in that direction. And I, and part of it was because that there are a lot of cool colors on Discovery and I just wanted to make sure that Picard felt different from Discovery. But also I kind of, I get all my ideas for this from the main character. So it's from Picard and for me, he's trapped on earth, he's trapped in his vineyard. And so I went for the colors of the vineyard. So to me, you mm. look at those gorgeous, um, shots of the vineyards when they're all of you know a burst in reds and, and the club mm. falls from the harvest is yellows it's oranges there's of course green and so i wanted to just go for a very warm color palette um and and it's hard because you actually you know certain things start happening when you're uh, doing um star trip card there's a lot of stuff that actually happens before i even start it and mm. so there are places where they wanted to go cooler. I was like, no, let's make this a warm show. And so mm. that was talking that back some. And even on the places like on the board cube, you know, it was very easy to go very uh, cool there, but I wanted to just still bring a little bit of warmth to, to, to it. We ended up going a little bit cooler just to add more contrast to it. But um, wherever I could, I wanted to bring in warm color lights, you know, let's yeah. bring in, especially for Picard's Chateau, I wanted lots of warmth in there with his furniture, with his his office that was going to go on with the ship. We did a lot, all those red and yellow lights to try mm. to keep warmth going in, the, in, in that space as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, it really demonstrates that, um, that the kind of future aesthetic that many of us have gotten accustomed to in our science fiction media is just one model. Um, but I think it really um, helps to make the, the larger sort of issues of the show, um, issues of like, identity and you know sentience and you know uh, where does life and the soul reside they're just mm. amplified by having you know this um the, this this really sort of as i say tactile very organic um kind of you know looking show as opposed to the kind of ikea etch-a-sketch kind of version um yeah, and, and Star Trek's always been positive, right? It's not a dystopian world. They have their issues and conflicts, but it's not dystopian. And so it's fun to play around with things like, okay, um, they there should be no pollution issues. Let's mm. have more green space. Let's have more opening. You know, there are even things like there's the arch that he goes through when he goes to the Star Starfleet. To um, Starfleet, mm -hmm. then if that's the way they communicate, uh, trans trans. That if that's the way they transport, then mm -hmm. there shouldn't be cars. If there are no cars, then, it would, you know, let's talk about what it sounds like. You don't have the mm. sound of horns and all that stuff. So, you know, we kind of just played around with what the Star Trek future is like and bringing that into uh, dis every decision that we made. Mm -hmm. Michelle, so much of your work has been in ensemble-driven mm -hmm. shows um, that really depend upon creating you know, believable relationships among yeah. um, the core cast. In what ways did you bring that experience to working on Picard? Uh, well, I, I have to say, Patrick, the, almost the moment that Patrick um, walks on set, you know, like everybody else around him, sort of like, you know, you sort of sit up straight and you think of like, oh, I gotta be on my, you know, P's and Q's and just be all good because you're thinking Sir Patrick Stewart. But I will tell you that, because um, on television sets as well as movie sets, the tone is always, is generally set by number one on the call sheet, you know? And literally, you know, as soon as Patrick walks on a set, he, he's so disarming and he's so um, generous and he's so, uh, you know, brave and kind and um, self-deprecating and funny um, and incredibly ensemble focused, mm -hmm. you know? And his concept of ensemble is not only the actors, it's everybody. You know, he, he's inclusive of, you know, craft services to wardrobe to the, you know, boom guy. 
So it was really easy on this one because it really takes that kind of a, um, uh, environment to create a, 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 you know, a group of people that work so well together to function in a, you know, in a spaceship. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, with Patrick, it was really, it really, it was just so easy. You know, he and I, Picard and Rafi have a relationship, have a past relationship. Um, and I was kind of curious as how I was going to kind of vet that out with Patrick, Michelle and Patrick. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just super easy because as soon as you start talking to him and looking in his eyes and being as truthful as you can, he's giving you so much uh, that we can sort of, uh, you know, uh, bounce on that. And the other actors, I mean, you know, Santiago, I, I, I could, you know, I'm a happy girl every day. I have to work with him. I think we can all agree why. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, he's just, he's just there. It, it's just, uh, it really started with Patrick. Patrick is the, the number one um, influence as, as how we, you know, begin our work, how we um, focus on um, vetting out issues. We all work together. I mean, there have been times where we were shooting on, uh, shooting a scene and Patrick would literally say, no, no, this is wrong. The fans will know this is wrong. And we stop. Everybody stops, producers, writers come out, whatever, and we sit down, we talk it, we fix it, we figure out what's the problem, and we, you know, approach it uh, again. You know, it's, um, he's a really, he's a true, generous leader. And all the other shows I've ever been on, you know, you, you, there's an ensemble concept to it, but there's also sometimes this sort of weird hierarchy that people sort of want to feel, you know, whatever, I'm this way or whatever. Not with Patrick. And he really um, sets the tone so that none of us feel that way. We all feel like we're coming to work to tell the story because the most important person are the fans. That's amazing. I mean, you, what you have here is this show called Star Trek Picard, and yet you're saying that, you know, uh, Patrick Stewart's, you know, MO is this profound generosity, and that really profound. comes across on screen. There was, although we are, you know, immersing ourselves in this world, you know, um, again, with this, again, this beloved character, at no point do you think, well, I don't need to be paying attention to what is going on with Rafi or Rios. Like, we are just as compelled to find out what their backstories are. And that does come across in the ways that you interact. Every person that Patrick Stewart, JL, is talking to yeah. is important to him. You know, he, you know, maintains that kind of, you know, insistence on, on making sure that everyone feels important. I, I love that. I want to ask a question since you said JL. One thing I thought was so interesting, um, I love that she called him JL. I yeah, thought that's yeah. a lot about the history. Mm -hmm. But there were so many um, twi Twitter responses from fans who were like, nah, -uh, you don't I know. Call JL. I was curious what your reaction was to that. <laughs> it was crazy, right? I thought, I, I, same here. I was like, did I just offend everybody? Because I'm calling him JL. People were like, that is just not acceptable. <laughs> but I, I, you know, I, I wish that people would take a, even a little bit more of a look into that. Because mm -hmm. as much as they feel that it's uh, inappropriate, is as much as it informs them about Rafi. Right. <laughs> yes. You know, like, that's part of it. You know, Rafi, they've had a relationship and she, she knows that he probably doesn't want to be called JL, and she started JL straight off the bat. I mean, it might have been like a little window where she called him, you know, Picard, Admiral Picard or whatever, but she, she slid in that JL real quick, and, I, and now I think after time, I think he appreciates it. But I was amazed too, Hanalei. I, I didn't know what to do with that when I got all that response of like- uh, I'm not surprised. You Are know, you, yeah. um, Star Trek fans obviously can be just like any, you know, nerd fandom can be incredibly proprietary of characters and franchises they love, right? But I love how that very small thing demonstrates so much about their relationship. Rafi is not going to defer to Picard, mm -hmm. but also her relationship to him is different than the relationship that, sh that he had with Riker or with Data or with Gein. It is right. fundamentally different, but also right. he is different. This is, you know, a Jean-Luc Picard who is, in a sense, no longer Jean-Luc Picard. He is older. He is recognizing his vulnerabilities. And so I, I thought that was a way to demonstrate all of that with just one syllable. J yeah. J I thought that was, you know, a master stroke. And then right. I loved how other characters started calling him, you know, <laughs> JL, throughout the, the rest of the show. Um, Hanalei, I want to talk to you about the pilot in particular, because I remember uh, watching the pilot and just being blown away. I knew you were so plugged in mm -hmm. because, and it was, it was two things in particular, um, the action sequences with the character of Dodge. I would love if you could talk about how you, know, you blocked those out, how you framed those. 
Um, but also, you know, small moments like um, in, in episode two, the kind of, you know, really just masterful editing of, you know, these two stories going against each other. Can you talk a little bit first about the shooting those action sequences? Mm -hmm. Um, I was so happy we got to shoot that action sequence. It was in the original script, and then um, it ended up being cut once we were, you know, working out budget and time and everything. And when we saw the first um, cut of the pilot, we really felt like we needed this introduction to Dodge. And so once it was, these first two episodes were decided to become three, and I was going to shoot additional stuff, I got to shoot that scene. And so I was very excited about that. And what was important to me, because I had actually shot the scene with Lars and Shaban first, mm -hmm. was that it needed to feel very different. And so we had already developed a different fighting style for Dodge, which you saw on the rooftop scene. Um, and we had a different style for, for Shaban and Lars. And I also wanted to shoot that differently. It's the first time she's activated. And so I decided to, instead of using handheld stuff, which was like, pretty visceral and you were like right in the midst and it's very uh, interestingly, you know, just cutting. I wanted to have a little bit more of a flow to it. Uh, mm -hmm. And also I just, you know, where we shot the, the space that was her apartment was literally the student lounge area at this school. And so very generic, boring looking spot but we were able to do this green screen out the window so you could see the Boston future. So it also wanted to kind of incorporate as much of those great views in the background of the shot and make a silhouette if I could, because I always think that looks really cool. Yeah. Um, and so that was kind of my thinking with that. And you know, you never have enough time. We got obviously great stuff, I'm very happy with it, but I still know the shot that I really wanted to get. We were at hour 14. <laughs> and he was like, okay, we're done, sorry. <laughs> no, but we're ready to roll. Uh, but um, yeah, but ultimately it, that, uh, that seemed really great and it just felt so different from the other fight and that was what I was going for. Yeah. And then you asked about, it was it was this, but also, and this is this is so small, um, but this is something that I've heard from other um, black viewers of the show. Um, when Picard goes to the archive to you know and ultimately finds that that painting um, of Data's, you know, called Daughter, the index is this very fair-skinned actor, but with tightly coiled poor sea hair, and this is a, you know an AI essentially. And I just thought it was such smart casting because, again, this goes to the, the notion of the really limited kind of future aesthetics that, you know, unfortunately, you know, we, we've had to deal with as viewers. The idea that you would create an AI or a synth that was not a white person, mm. that was not a white person with long, silky hair, you know? <laughs> that this would be a choice that you would make, that this would be something that you would want to do. And this is not an actor, you know, that, um, that we see, um, I believe, again, uh, in, you know, the show. I don't know that we'll ever see her again. But it is those small moments, and they keep popping up. It's like, you know, the use of JL as a nickname. It is just these small moments that really tell you so much about, you know, the world that you have constructed, both as a director, Michelle, you as an actor, um, that just feel so so inclusive and you know so much something um, that fans of all stripes can can enter into i don't have to paint myself in there there's already space for me there i don't that's have right. to about that, that space um, i want to ask just one last question of mine and then i'm going to uh, throw it to audience q and a um, and if both of you can take sort of your version of this so i don't want to ask you you know, what it's like working in um, this particular kind of genre TV versus the other, you know, TV um, directing that you've done. Um, and then Michelle, same question for you, you know, kind of the, the challenges and opportunities of working on, you know, a science fiction show like this versus, you know, contemporary, you know, uh, you know, drama, et cetera. I think the biggest challenge is that you can't just go out and buy <laughs> stuff you, you 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 know everything has to be built and so everything you have to have that time to design it to improve that design to then build it to have enough of it you know it's not so easy to get multiples 
of their outfits for fighting, you know, yeah. and our, our, our teams were, they were up against it. Our costume yeah. designer, uh, Christine, our, our production Amazing. designer, Todd, our, you know, our props to, um, maker, they were all up against it. So mm -hmm. that's the big, for me, the biggest challenge is freeing in that you can imagine, you know, anything. Mm -hmm. And I always like to kind of keep it grounded to what makes sense in our world too. So, and I also like mixing in uh, what could be super futuristic and what would be like a thing that would still be the same all these years later, or what would be the, the, the um, uh, uh, um, antique that you would still have in your possession. But then how do we take something and really elevate it and make it feel futuristic? Mm -hmm. So that's, to, that's the biggest challenge is then having the time and the budget to do those things right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's really quite interesting. I love what you said, by the way, um, about paint yourself. You said uh, paint myself into a story. <laughs> um, it's actually one of the main reasons why I've chosen over the almost 30 years, the parts that I have picked, mm -hmm. because I wanted to make sure that people of color especially women of color would see themselves represented in roles that weren't necessarily what they were, um, you know, the ones that were open to us back in the day. I've always tried, if you look track of my stuff, I'm, I'm always trying to be the boss, the person in charge. Um, you know, I, my, my agents and I joke all the time that if there's a role that requires wearing a heel, wearing heels or carrying a gun, I take the gun every time because I, that's, you know, I'm like, mm, I don't need all that. I want to be here. Um, because I want to make sure that, as you said, paint yourself that there are people that are, when I was little, I didn't see myself represented anywhere. It wasn't until I got older and went to college and started, you know, getting cast that I realized, oh my God, everybody sees me as a minority. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought I went to college so that I could have the opportunity to play Juliet. Mm -hmm. and, and instead, I was informed that I went to college so that I could play the maid, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's one of those things I was like, okay, copy that, then I'm going to make it my initiative to make sure that there's those little, you know, beige and brown girls with crazy curly hair walking around the streets and they can see themselves represented and that they're not alone because it's important. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting about playing uh, sci-fi, um, especially considering that I've done majority of my work in sort of contemporary modern stuff, mm -hmm. you know, law and order cop stuff and all that, mm -hmm. I always thought that those were the shows that pushed an agenda forward, you know, that we were able to tell those true stories and maybe make a difference, and which is true in some format. But what I found, um, to my joy, is that when you work in sci-fi, we get to push those same agendas forward in a way that is entertaining, mm -hmm. um, is exciting and passionate, that's not preachy, that we almost slip the story through. Our, you know, we, our message, message gets through at the end of the episode and you sort of sit back and go, oh my God, they're totally talking about immigration. Right. They, were talking about Im they were talking about exclusion. They weren't talking about inclusion. They were talking about exclusive, you know, the otherisms and, and how do we get away, you know, how do we um, not take responsibility for our for th obligations that we've, we've said we would take care of, like our word. How do we, you know, really interesting, very topical um, topics. <laughs> so for me, the, um, you know, it's not so much that I change my acting, although I will say that I always, whenever I approach any kind of um, job, whatever medium it is, say I'm just I'm auditioning for television, to me, uh, every single network uh, and every single writer and half hour hour is a different genre. Mm -hmm. So for me, I try to do my work when I'm auditioning for something, um, to know that if I'm auditioning for something on NBC, it's an hour long on NBC is a completely different genre than a half hour on Fox, mm -hmm. right? So this is a different genre. So it's just this, the, the way that you um, approach that kind of work. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, um, I don't have to do any kind of strange, you know, uh, forced acting because the writing is so good mm -hmm. that all I have to do is you know ingest those words understand what i'm talking about what point of view i am what my my desire is what i need to get across um put my hand myself in my directors and my producers hands and um go forth so it's not so much that you do a straight you know like some weird kind of sci-fi acting uh it's almost that you want to be as truthful as you possibly can um and that way you let the environment 
uh, the direction of, you know, the special effects, the, the wardrobe, the makeup, all that do its job and you stay true to telling the story and what, what's at the core of your character's point of view. That's fantastic. Um, okay, so going to audience questions now. And yes, anyone who's watching, please feel free again to use that Q&A at the bottom. I'm just gonna, um, you know, pick them in, in random order. This is from Andrea. So Hanalei, what was the process of getting chosen as a director um, for the pilot of Picard? Did you have to pitch yourself or your vision for it? And if so, did you focus on a specific angle of Star Trek that you wanted to shine a light on? Mm -hmm. So um, I was shocked when I got the call from my agent that they wanted to talk to me about shooting Picard. Mm -hmm. um, and I asked, okay, can I read the script? And they said, no, it was top secret. <laughs> Just come in and just talk to, to them. So I, um, I can't just walk into a meeting without preparing. Mm -hmm. And so I started looking at some of my favorite episodes of, of Picard and also thinking about what I felt like if I was writing the story where his character would be. And with that in mind, came up with some ideas of look and stuff based on that. And um, that first meeting went very well, so they gave me the script and, and gave me the weekend to work on doing a full on lookbook. I came back wow. in and had that meeting with the lookbook and that they liked. So then they, and they had to go through a few channels. And then of course, Patrick Stewart had to also approve. And so they sent him the lookbook and he liked it. And then we had a phone call, which was incredible. Oh, and that's mm -hmm. how it led to the job. And like every step of the way, I, you know, well, from the first, the first call, I was like, they're not going to hire me. So I wasn't that stressed about it because I just knew it wasn't going to happen. But at right. the time I got a step further, I was like, oh my God, this, this, might, just, this might be happening. Uh, and so, it, you know, it was thrilling to, to get that call. Mm -hmm. hmm. Fantastic. Uh, this question is from Diane. We have a tough time casting Black leads in sci-fi. It was a gift to cast Lawrence Fishburne as our lead, but that project was one of so many where POC cast were reasoned away. Mm. Um, how do each of you handle this industry norm? Ooh, ooh. That's that interesting. That, yeah. yeah, that reasoned away thing kind of drives me a little batty. That's like when I go to, you know, if I'm auditioning for a theater or Shakespeare or something, and they're like, oh, we're going to do this, you know, Hamlet in Africa, so we can, you know, you can be our Ophelia. You want to go, what, what do you? Right. <laughs> I, it, that's a very frustrating, I, I appreciate the question and, and the, the, the um, awareness of that situation from the asker. Um, because for as an actor, it's incredibly frustrating. I can't, you know, I, it's one of the things that, um, you know, bless my, my agents and my, my managers, because they get it from me all the time. I'm constantly like, look, stop sending me in on just black women. Mm -hmm. You see the breakdown that says Chinese man, send me in on that one. And I, I kid you not, I've said yeah. that. Because I, you know, again, I want to go, you know, if this visual, this right here, this visual had any vocation, she'd still look like this. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense that when we all of a sudden create art, this visual can only be one vocation. It doesn't make sense. In life, I can do anything. So then in art, I should be able to do anything. So um, I, I would just, you know, hope that our casting people are brave. I mean, like what, you know, the old story about the original Lethal Weapon, you know, the, the, the director hadn't even thought of a black person for Danny Glover's part until the casting director said, hey, how about this guy? Mm -hmm. So. Um, to me, there should be, you know, I'm, I, I go all the way back to scripts. I just, um, I really don't appreciate, my actor, my husband is a, a white man, he's an actor, very, very good actor. Um, and I always say to him, he's in every single script because you open up a script, every single script you read, even a predominantly black script is gonna have a white man in there someplace. Not so much for us. Right. And, what, and that frustrates me. So mm -hmm. I would appreciate if people are going to write scripts, because oftentimes you get a script and it says, you know, Joe, da, 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 Mary, da, 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 blah, 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 you know, Shaniqua, black. You're like, why, why you didn't say the name, the ethnicity <laughs> of the other characters? Yeah. You know, why, why are you assuming that the person who's reading it is seeing it through your white eyes? Mm -hmm. When I read a script, I see it through my eyes, this colored woman's eyes. So mm -hmm. every character is different colors right. until they say it. So I would appreciate either they don't put any ethnicities on any of the characters or they write ethnicities for every single character. That means you say, John, Caucasian, Mary, Caucasian, so-and-so, Caucasian, and then you say Latino or black. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, I would encourage casting directors to, to you know, chuck that shit and just open the door and let us 
let us try to fight as best we can as artists to, to be the best actor in the room. Like and it. I would say keep pushing your casting director too. Mm -hmm. You know, um, yep. if the casting director is saying, I can't find people, say, keep looking, you know, <laughs> try all, all avenues. That's right. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic because you mentioned that the character of Rafi was not written as, you know, a woman of color. And yet you, thank God, were cast, Michelle. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking there is a scene in season one, uh, the scene between you and your son, that is so heartbreaking and just has stayed with me. Mm -hmm. And I think about the richness of that scene, but also about what you brought. Mm -hmm. um, and it matters to me. If you were a woman of color playing that role, because so often we don't get to see women of color be vulnerable and be mm. flawed in that complicated way. You either get flat and flawed or mm. you get, you know, um, flat and perfect. Mm. But to be able to, you know, show a woman in all your three dimensionality and it's yeah. a woman of color wrestling with addiction and grief and, you know, parental neglect and, and all of that. Okay, you know, a, a white actor could have done that, but it was, it, there's so much more meaning for me as a viewer watching someone like you do it. And we don't get that if casting directors refuse to bring in um, other people. So, I, I, exactly, yeah. Yeah, that was a really important scene. I really, I love that um, they gave me that opportunity to do that because I wanted to tell the story. Um, there's two really important points of view there. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, Rafi's, but the child's point of view as well, you know. There are so many people who have gone, we all know people who, who have addictions. It could be anything. It could be addicted, you know, drugs, alcohol, exercise, sex, food. I mean, there's addictions, right? Um, and, you know, a lot of times we project addic addictions to these people who are, you know, uh, we, don't, we no longer can interact with. They're nodding out on the side of the street. They're, um, you know, a disappointment to the family. And what I really wanted to show that there are people who are struggling, you know, just fucking struggling to just get up in the morning to get to the front door, you know, that they're still valuable to our society, but they're battling, they're trying hard to, to you know, um, get better. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really wanted to, to see that struggle within Rafi. And then I thought it was imperative for us to see that struggle and the reality of the son, that he doesn't have to say, yes, you're welcome back, that he has every single right to say, no, mm -hmm. you hurt me. Yeah. I, I don't know if I can trust you ever again. And I say, no. And then to see Rafi somehow understand that and, and just step back mm -hmm. to her own heartbreak, her own pain. That wasn't the, the way the, the meeting was supposed to end. And yet she had to step back and sort of say that. And I really love to show the complexities of, you know, of women mm -hmm. who are struggling um, daily to achieve what they want to achieve. They're, they're not bad people. Mm -hmm. They're not to be written off. They're not you know, losers. They're just doing the best they can with what they can. Yeah. Um, next question is from Brenda. It's for Hanalee. Michael Shabon is primarily known as a literary writer, and the show has a very literary feel to it. It's very cerebral, focused on the interior of the characters, as opposed to moving from plot point to plot point. Um, how did Michael's background help inform your direction choices in the first three episodes? Brenda says she's especially thinking of your choices to let every shot linger a few beats beyond what other sci-fi shows would do and how you gave each scene that space to breathe. Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly it. I mean, um, for me, I wanted this again, distinguishing Picard from Discovery. Discovery moves very, 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 very fast. Mm -hmm. And I felt like a show centered on Picard would move slower. He's mm -hmm. older, he's trapped, you know, until he gets that, that impetus that happens, that gives him a purpose and sends him on that journey, I felt like we would move slow. And so even editorially, our choices were to do a slower cut. And the funny thing is, um, that first uh, director's cut was too slow for, for, for Alex Kurtzman. <laughs> but, so we were like, wait, we talked about being slow. Uh, but it was a little too slow for them. So we, we sped it up a little bit. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, that was all deliberate. Let's let it linger. And it's such a character-driven show. You just want to give, you just want to be on the actors and see their faces and see their reactions to stuff. That's awesome. Okay, last two questions. Uh, this one is from Natalia. Science fiction has been something that women um, can have, excuse me, can be able to have a voice and be more than just the female that needs um, 
to be saved. Do you see science fiction pushing through even more in the future? And where do you see all of this coming into all different genres? Both Hanalee, you and Michelle, you have both worked, you know, extensively in other genres as well. But, you know, what sort of opportunities do you see perhaps that, you know, science fiction is given that we can, you know, extrapolate into other genres? Hey, that's interesting. I just yeah. I feel like just the industry as a whole, I don't know how much we can credit to sci-fi, except that sci-fi tends to be progressive and takes those risks. And as mm. the things are successful and the audience is responding to that, then the people who create are then feel okay, we can take these risks as well. And so maybe it's mm. we're helping the whole movement that we have so many more female-driven stories and yeah. so many more stories that are led by uh, characters of color. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe, so I would like to say that it's helping in that way. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you, Hanalei. I think um, it's interesting, and you're a perfect example of this, you know, perhaps the, the um, you know, the sci-fi world enables people of color uh, to be a part of it in front and behind cameras because it's telling the stories of people who are disenfranchised often, who are, you know, others, right? Um, because we're sci-fi, so we're in space and we have people who are blue, you know, so you have something that's a different thing as opposed to like Law and Order, who's, you know, it's gonna be people from New York. Um, so I think maybe the, you know, the, the valuable contribution that sci-fi has done consciously or subconsciously, it's uh, um, empowered, um, you know, even just by them making the phone call to Hanale, Mm -hmm. that, you know, they were in the world of Star Trek and they're like, what have we not done? This is what we haven't done. I'm not necessarily sure that, you know, every network sort of does, what have we not done? Let a black woman cast, you know, I don't think they've, they, they've broken it down that way. But right. perhaps <laughs> sci-fi can encourage that because they can see the, um, the product, that the product of having reached out and uh, expanded their horizons and hired people of color and women of color, um, that their product has been more um, uh, diverse, obviously, but more um, inclusive in in how they tell the story and who the story hits, and therefore the people who want to watch the story. So perhaps um, you know sci we can say thank you to Sci-Fi for being the ones that are brave enough to tell the stories of people who are not normally given the opportunity to have a story told. Awesome. All right, so our final question, um, Hanalee, is for you. So as I mentioned at the top of the hour, um, through the invaluable assistance of Reframe, I was able to coordinate this fantastic conversation with you. Hanalee, you are a, a Reframe Rise director. So can you just, you know, at the end, for people who don't really know what Reframe is, what it means to be a Reframe Rise director, can you talk about how that support has helped um, your career? Mm -hmm. Definitely. So Reframe Rise is a program of eight directors that they, you know, are mid-career, that they feel are really poised to move on to something um, greater, whatever that goal is for the director, be it a feature film or your first pilot um, or, you know, whatever it is. And so what you get are five high-level industry sponsors, or uh, maybe it's, maybe it's, I have five. I don't know what the number is for the various ladies, but you get this group and so I have people who are high level in TV, people who are high level in features and they um, serve as champions for me. So mm -hmm. if I'm going out for um, a project, I can have them call my behalf. They also serve as, some, as a sounding board. So um, one specific example is that um, at my first meeting, I was able to show them my lookbook for a project called A Thousand Miles and they gave me some invaluable notes which I went and then incorporated into my lookbook and then went and pitched it and I ended up ultimately getting that feature film. And um, I think that that was, they were a huge help for that. I think they were um, also a huge help for um, getting Kung Fu, the pilot for that. Again, I was able to um, run my lookbook by them. Um, I have, you know, my sponsors were able to call on my behalf and vouch for me. And what you really need, um, what women really need and directors of color sometimes are just to have that person who's willing to make the call and say, yes, you should hire her. She can do it. She'll deliver for you um, to give people who are still like a little bit afraid to take the risk just to make them feel comfortable and, and have them give you give the yes to that person. Mm -hmm. that's, that's phenomenal. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, 
And with that, we are going to wrap up our conversation with Hanalee and Michelle. Thank you. Thank you both so much. This has been huge for me personally as a Star Trek fan, as a someone who has absolutely loved um, Star Trek Picard and the work that both of you have done to make that show as special as it is. But also just want to thank you on behalf of the women in film uh, members who are watching today. This was invaluable and really inspirational. So thank you all for being with me. And I hope that we can chat again soon after the ending of season two for Card. You know, we'll come back. Absolutely. Thank you so right. much. It was a joy. <laughs> Thank you all, and we will see you on Wednesday for our next conversation and connections. Talk to you soon.